slide show initiated. Oh, wait, not from there. I want to go where we start from. Yuck. Oh, man. thing is not willing to oh we've got to go through all this again but actually it's going more quickly this time good now usually it gives me an option of going to where we last were and it's not doing it so don't have to find it uh we're beginning average rate of change right which is like the four example six Ah, here we go. Right. Okay. I think we're there now. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just uh, let me get this. It's so hard to get this to open. Let me get it. Ah, okay. Now I think we were we need to be a minute and a half for that to open up. That's too long. Okay, now what did you say? 19 on the 1.5? Okay. All right. Next page over. This is page 56. Let me get my pen activated here. All right. Page 56. This is 1.5 exercise, and this is number 19, you said? Okay. It says find the zeros of the function, and these exercises find the zeros of the function algebraically. And here's your function. f of x, our favorite name for a function, at least the book's favorite name, is equal to 1 half x cubed. Minus x. Okay, that's a good question. All right, what's the first thing you do? Because we're asked to find the zeros of the function. Set a equal to zero, because that's what it means. The function, the y value, the f of x, is the zero. Okay, so you do that first. Now, what was your first inclination you said? Factor it. I think that's the way to go because here we have a polynomial here. It is a polynomial, even though it has a fractional uh, coefficient. No sweat there. Still a polynomial. And when you have a polynomial on this side with degree 2 or greater and 0 on the other side, the first best guess, factor. Okay? So let's factor out, what did you say? X. Okay? And what does that leave you with? 1 half x squared minus 1. Okay? That's equal to 0. And that's a rather nasty looking situation, isn't it? So, huh. What's that? You, okay. If that were x squared minus 1, yes, you could. It's not. It's 1 half x squared minus 1. So my next, let's back up a step, okay? And I don't know about you, okay? But sometimes I don't like fractions as well as I do some other numbers, okay? So what might we do before we try to factor? Multiply everything by 2. That's legal if you got... An equation here, you do the same thing to both sides, it's still an equivalent equation. So let's multiply everything on this side by 2 and everything over here by 2. What does that give you here? x cubed minus 2x equal 
zero. Okay. Now, let's factor now. Still going to be problematic, but at least we can deal with it. Factor out the x. That gives you x squared minus 2 equals 0. Okay? Now, where do we go from here? Set each of those equal to 0. So either x is equal to 0 or x squared minus 2 is equal to 0. Okay? Now, if that were the difference of two perfect squares, factoring is legal. Now, you might say, but it sort of is. 2 is the perfect square of the square root of 2. But I don't know if you think of that. It's not a perfect square, as in it has a whole number as a square root, but it has an irrational number. But you can get at it another way. By the way, here is one of your zeros right there. What you can also do is treat this as a solving a linear equation, add 2 to both sides, and that gives you x squared is equal to 2. And now what could you do? Take the square root of both. Here is where you have to be sure you remember one thing. Plus or minus the square root of 2. There's your other two solutions. Positive square root of 2, negative square root of 2. Okay? Now, Pretty obvious, I hope. Now forget about the two here and that. Let's just go back to our original equation, our original function. Now for zero is what, zero cubed? Zero, one half times zero. Zero minus zero is zero. Okay, that one worked. Not too much doubt on that. Let's see if these other two work. Let's first do the positive square root. Square root of two Positive square root of 2 cubed. Does anyone know what that is? Okay, 2 is the square root of 2 cubed, right? Which is square root of 2 times square root of 2 times the square root of 2. Square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2 times square root of 2. So this will be 2 root 2, right? This 2 takes out the 2 on the outside and you're just left with a root 2, right? Now, if you put a root 2, remember the positive root 2 here, minus root 2, sure enough, that's 0. Let's see if the negative one will work. What's the cube of negative square root of 2? Negative 2 root 2. The 2's go out, and that gives you negative root 2. But then when you put a negative root 2 in here, a minus times a minus is plus root 2, and that is also adds to 0. Yes, all three of those work. A rather strange one. We hadn't done any with radicals in them, but they are doable. Okay? Another thing you could have done, had you not wanted to do it that way, you could have used a quadratic formula. A little awkward for this simple of a problem, but that would be doable too. Or, like I said before, notice that 2 is the square root is the perfect square of the square root of 2. So you could have done x minus the square root of 2 times x plus the square root of 2 equals 0, and that would give you the same two answers. So there are several ways to get there. It was a strange problem. But that answers your question? Okay. Is that the answer they had in the back? Yeah, I hope so. If not, we got to write the editor. Okay, this is chapter 1.5. Let's see if we can find it back here somewhere. Uh, 1.5. Oh, this is, yeah, this is right. This is just very poorly laid. There's 1.2. Goodness gracious, this is not 7. We got it. 1.3. Goodness gracious. There's 1.5. Okay. Number 19 was it? 0 plus or minus square root of 2. Good for them. I'm proud of them. Okay. Put this in the back. Mark my space. Okay.
Good question, by the way. Any others? All right. Now, just to... Ooh. <laughs> going to clear the screen, but it's good at work. What we're talking about now is average rate of change. When you hear average rate of change, what comes to mind? How about average? What does that do? Mediocre? Mean? No, that's not what we're talking about. Not quite. What are we talking about? We are talking about mean, by the way. What do we mean by average? How do you calculate your average? Every everything together and divide. So adding and dividing is somehow involved here. But another form of addition is also <coughs> subtraction. So that's a little bit of a stretch. What do we mean by weight of change? Okay. What you're doing, change indicates differences. A rate also indicates dividing. So average, this is average rate of change. Have we heard something like this before? We'll see. We have learned that the slope of a line can be interpreted as the average rate of change of that line. So if that line is representing two quantities, the slope represents the average rate of change. Now, what if you have a nonlinear graph, so a line is not going to give you a perfect um, representation, but at least it gives you some representation. So let's do, um, if you have a nonlinear graph whose slope changes at every point. Now what they mean there, the slope here is there. Up here it's there. Here it's there. Now it's that. Now it's this. Now it goes back to here. So at every point, the slope of that line is changing. So what we might want to do is say, I don't care about the what's going on at the beginning or end. I want to do what's on the average. For instance, I left home this morning. I started off in reverse. I was going at a negative speed going back down the driveway. Then I turned and started pretty slowly and loaded my way through the residential area where we live, going at a pretty low rate of speed. Ultimately got to Red Mountain Expressway, picked up some speed, then got on the main expressway and, and uh, well, I actually had to do more. I had to take the dog to uh, a place this morning, so I had a lot more. But anyway, on most days, <laughs> then got on the interstate. I was not going the same speed I was back in the driveway, okay? Nowhere close, okay? And then I got off the interstate and had to wiggle around some to get here. Again, not going the same speed. I don't care what I was doing at every instant, but from the time I left home until the time I got here, I went a certain distance, right? That distance divided by that time gives me my average rate of speed, okay? That's what we're talking about. Not the instantaneous rate, what I was going on the expressway, looking in the rearview mirror to make sure it was okay to go that way. No, I didn't say that, did I? Okay? But, you know, John Long, or sitting at a stoplight, okay? That, you know, that was hindrances. I want to know what the average rate is. So, <clears throat> what we're doing then, between any two points, where I left home and when I got here, okay? The average rate of change would be, let's, this is an X now, that would be a time, the time that I left home, picked up the one at Homewood, okay? And the placement that I was, where I was on the map at that time, and where I am here at work, and, I mean, the time it got me to drive into the parking lot, and the placement I was when I drove there. That basically, we could say that's what we're dealing with here. So, how far did I go? The difference between my placement at home and my placement here at work. How long did it take? The difference between the times that, that measures that. What does that sound like? Difference, difference, divided. We did it in the last section. Say difference quotient. Same thing. But now we're calling average rate of change because now we have dimension quantity. But look at this. What does that also measure? Change of what 
does not stand for? Y over change of X. What does that mean? Slope, exactly. Okay? So we're talking about a slope. Uh, average rate of change would be the average slope. In other words, and this is just sort of a new word for us here, at least seems like it is, the, the straight line that goes between the initial point and the final point, that's called the secant line. Because it actually intersects the curve twice. Okay? That's the secant line. The slope of that secant line is the average rate of change. Sure, I wasn't traveling that same speed the whole time. And by the way, that would be what do I measure the difference in displacement? Positions? How far? Give me a unit. From how far from home to here? How would you measure that? Miles, okay. And how long it took me? Hours, okay. That would be miles divided by hours, miles per hour. You might say miles per minute, that would be fine too. However you want to measure the time. That is an average rate of change. When you have dimension units in it, that's what makes it a, a rate, okay? And that's not the only one. I could have talked about how much gas did I burn getting here, okay? Distance divided by number of gallons I used. Miles per gallon, that's, your ga your, your, that's the rate of change at which you're using the, the fuel. It's all over the place, all the time. It's the slope of the line through the two points. Okay? The average rate of change is the slope of that secant line between the two points. Okay. The line through two points is called the secant line, and the slope of that secant line, they denote as Y. Do we use M for slope? I don't know. I had a student say, after mountain, I thought, good answer as any I can think of. I don't know why we use M for slope, but we always have, haven't we? Y is equal to MX plus V. What does M stand for? Slope. Okay, y'all did that in earlier math, okay? So this is slope, and the FEC stands not for Southeastern Conference, but for the secant line, okay? The average rate of change from of L, so L is changing, L2 between L1 and L2, from, and L stands for Y, Y2, Y1, from x1 to x2, that would be the y2 minus y1, which is f of x2 minus f of x1, divided by x2 minus x1. Just like our different question. Change of y over change of x, that's the slope, and that happens to be represented the secret. The slope of the secret line. Same thing we did before, only we're giving it a different name. Oh, we've seen a function awfully close to that, not quite the same. But find the average rate of change of that function. Mm. X cubed, <coughs> X cubed minus, <coughs> sorry, X cubed minus X, 3X from X1 equal negative 2 to X2 equal negative 1. Okay? Now, Something in the back of my mind. No, we're okay. One of these coming up here, it seems like, is different from the slide set, it's from the book, but this one's the same. Okay, so let's do it. What are we going to have to do first? Before we can find the average rate. You tell me what's the average rate of change. What is that formula? Average rate of change. Average rate of change. What is that? Okay, y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1, if you want to think of it that way, that certainly is a good way to think of it. This is just right? Not... All right, good deal. Does anyone else come in while I was running my mouth up here and didn't notice you? Okay, everybody got it, everybody. Okay, now, since I don't see any y's in this problem, how can I also name that? f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. We're on example 6 on page 54. Okay? So what's one of the first thing I'm going to have to do before I can calculate that average rate of change? 
figure out what f of x2 is. Okay? Now, what is x2? In the first part, negative 1. And what would that be then? Negative 1 cubed minus 3 times, what'd you say? Negative 1. Perfect. I'm hard of hearing. So what's negative 1 cubed? Negative 1. Very good. What's minus 3 times minus 1? Say again. Plus 3. And what does that equal? Minus 1 plus 3. Say again. 2. Okay. So there's our f of x2. Uh, yeah, f of x2 happens to be 2. Okay. What's the next thing we've got to calculate? f of x1. We already know what x1 is. It's negative 2 in the a part anyway. Okay? So what is f of x1? How do I get it? Help me, help me. Yeah. Negative 2 cubed minus 3 times negative 2. Perfect. What's negative 2 cubed? Negative 8. And what's negative 3 times negative 2? Say again. Positive 6. And what does that come out being? Negative 2. Okay. So there's our f of x1. A negative 2. So this will be a negative 2. But we're subtracting those, so what we have is 2 minus a negative 2 divided by, what was our x2? Negative 1 minus a negative 2. Okay, a little bit of subtraction stuff going on here. What does that give us? That numerator is... 4. 2 plus 2 is 4. Didn't know you'd be doing such high-level math today, did you? Okay, 2 plus 2 is 4. And your denominator is? 1. Negative 1 plus 2 is 1, and that is 4. So the average rate of change from x equal negative 2 to x equal negative 1, what negative 2, you're down here at minus 2. Uh, yeah, at negative 2. The x1, you're down here at minus 2. There's your y value. And when you get up to negative 1 here, you're up here at positive 2. That's a pretty good increase, isn't it? Pretty steep slope for the performance. Looks good. All right. Now, the next part, I think I'll do a little erasing here because I'm all over the place. Okay. Now what we have to do is do another problem, except the pen won't come up. Okay, let's do the B part. This time we're going from x1 equals 0 to x2 equal 1. So what are we going to have to do first? You know, again, you're looking for your average rate of change. Okay, do I need to write it down again? Would that be helpful? What does that mean? f of, okay, I'm jumping on to the function. f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. We jot different x2s and x1s. I sort of wish they'd have changed the, the representation, but it's okay. And again, if, if you remember, do y2 minus y1. That's the same thing, then change it to f, okay? I was just being lazy. I didn't have a lot of room. So what is one of the first things we've got to do? Calculate what f of x2 is in the b part. Let me do this in a different color. What color would you like that? Second? Green. Dark green okay? I think it'll show up a little better. Okay. So f of x2 would be what? What is your x2 here? 
1. So how would you get f of x2? 1 cubed minus 3 times 1. And that would be, what's 1 cubed? 1 minus 3 would equal negative 2. So your f of x2 is negative 2. Now we move to the, and this will, I'm going to write it up here, negative 2, okay? Next we have to figure out what f of x1 is, and what is it? I don't know if you can read it with all my chicken scratch there, but let's see if we can clean that up a little bit. It won't come up. There it goes. Okay. All right, what's your x2? 1. Wait. Okay. Yeah. But the, yeah. There it is right there. F of x1 is 0. So, what does that come up being? F of x, f of 0 would be 0 cubed minus 3 times 0. That's going to be hard, isn't it? What does that come up being? 0. 0 cubed is 0. 3 times 0 is 0. 0 minus 0 is 0. 0. Okay. Got that done, so let's now plug and chuck. Okay, f of x2 was negative 2 minus 0. I think I can even do that one. And your x2 was 1, and your x1 was 0. I could maybe even do that. Anyone make a hazard to guess what that it might be? Negative 2. Let's see if that makes sense, okay? First, let's see if our points make sense. At x1, 0, we found out the f was 0. So 0, 0 is that first point. x2 equal 1. We found out when x, uh, x2 is 1, your answer is negative 2. So 1, negative 2, that's sure enough, right? Who oh, there, we're going downhill pretty quickly. Not as quickly as we went uphill before, but still pretty fast. That's the slope of negative 2. Make sense? average rate of change between those two was pretty negative. So you start it off real good, if your positive is good, and at some point you hit sort of a low there, but then you turn around and pick up the positive again. So came out okay at the end. Does that make sense? All right. Let's see how they do it. Probably not going to be a lot different, but let me... I don't think I need to clear this, but just in case they write anything else on there. No, they don't. The average rate of change from x1 of negative 2 to x2 of negative 1 is f of x2, just like we did, plugging that in, and that gave us, ooh, they didn't show how to plug it in, but we did, 2 minus a minus 2, which is 4 over 1, 4. Secant line, positive slope, 4. Okay? For the second part, the f2 was now, x2 was now 1, the, the x1 was 0. Plugging those in, uh, we give negative 2 minus 0. Now, not always, <laughs> if x is 0, will your function be 0? It just happens to be that in this case. Um, and that would be a negative 2. So that secant line is going downhill fairly quickly. Okay. Make sense? All right. That was example six. It looks like they're skipping example seven, so let's do that. And this is one, I think, uh, uh, the distance S, oh, let's go back to black, or dark purple, okay. The distance S measured in feet. Now, that doesn't mean it's a function of feet. That's just the units. The S measured in feet of a moving car is from a stoplight is given by the function S of T is equal to, let's see, remember S is standing for distance, is equal to 20 T to the 3 halves power. Suddenly, they really jumped into exponential notation and uh, roots and stuff. Y'all did that, so hopefully it's nothing new to you. But this is the function. 
where t is a time in seconds. So t is measured in seconds, okay? And s is measured in feet, okay? It says find the average rate of speed of the car. Now, I'll just tell you this off the top. This is leaving the stoplight. This is not going to the stoplight. If you're going toward a stoplight, that had better be a negative number. You better be slowing down. The distance would probably better be decreasing. This is an increasing function. As t goes up, you're taking the, that to the three halves power. So that's going up and multiplying by a pretty large number, 20. That's going up. So this is the distance after you left the stoplight, okay, in feet as a function of time. At time t equals zero, what was your distance from the stoplight? Not part of the problem, I don't think. It may be, but at time t equals zero, that means you're right there at the stoplight. What's your distance from the stoplight? Zero, exactly. Zero to the three has power. Still zero. Two and times zero is zero. So you're at the stoplight, and then from there on, you're increasing your distance slowly at first, but then it's going to pick up as you go. So it's sort of making sense. All right. So this is the distance of a moving car from a stoplight given by that function. The t is in seconds. Find the average speed of the car. So I'm going to shorten this a little bit. Average speed. Average rate of change. Okay. Um, lost. It. There it is. Okay. Find the average speed of the car. And the A part says... From T, ah, we just did it. T1 equals 0 to T2 equals 4 seconds. From T, T1 equals 0 to T2 equals 4 seconds. So in the first 4 seconds, what's your average rate of speed? Average speed. How would you do that? First, you've got to see what is your average speed or average rate of change. You tell me. Oh, it was a long time ago. What is it? S, yeah, S of T2 minus S of T1. Or, I don't know, you may have said S2 minus S1. That would be a perfectly good way to express it as well. Over, second, T2 minus T1. Very good. So what's one of the first things we're going to have to do to find the answer to that question? Plug and chug, okay? So we need to know what S of T2 is. And what is your T2 in this case? S of 4 seconds is going to be what? 20 times 4 to the 3 halves power. Okay, that's it. Time out. Okay, what do we mean by something to the three halves power? Okay, it means one of two things. He just said one of them correctly. It's four, the square root of four, and I don't know how you meant that, cubed, or the square root of four cubed. Okay, both of those were the sound of the same. It's either the square root of four cubed, or the square root of 4 cubed. Now, which of those do you think is easiest to calculate? The one on the right. Yeah, let's take the square root first and then cube it. They're equivalent. They're the same. But it's a lot more work to cube 4. We get up to 64, by the way, and then take the square root of that. That's not that bad. That's 8. But what if you do this? The square root of 4. 2 and cube 2, and you got 8. You get the same answer. It's a lot smaller numbers. Therefore, I'm lazy. I like to do it that way. So that's going to be, this will be 20 times, what do we say that was? 8. And what's that equal to? 160. And what's that measured in? Say again. Feet. The S is measured in feet. Okay, very good. What's the next thing we're going to have to fiddle with? S of T1. S of T1. And what's your T1? Zero. Oh, boy, that's going to be hard, isn't it? 
We already did it. What did we come find that to be? Zero. We already did that earlier. I didn't think back that we were going to do this. So I think we're ready to plug and chug. What's your S of T2? 160 feet divided by, what's your T2? Four seconds minus zero is four seconds, right? And what would that come out being? 40 feet per second. See, you got units, use them. They're your friends. Okay. Now, part B, you still want green or something else this time? Say again? I'm sorry? Something else. What else? Pick something. Blue. B for blue. I like it. Okay. All right. We'll do B and blue. Well, I was going to try to do B and blue. Okay. So let's do B. The B part says from T1 equal 4 to T2 equal 9 seconds. From T1 equal 4 seconds to T2 equal 9 seconds. Okay? Guess what? Same formula. We're looking for average speed. Okay, do I need to write it down again? You think you know where we're going to go with it. Is it helpful to write it down get it planted in your mind good? Okay, that's going to be S of T2 minus S of T1. And by the way, just so it doesn't throw you later, the subscripts don't really matter here that much. you got to do what they tell you. But some books will call it T0 and T1. I'll say, oh, I don't know how to do that. And yes, you do. It's just changing the subscript. It's S of T1 minus S of T0. This book is using T1 and T2. It doesn't matter. First time, second time, initial time, next time, whatever you call it. Okay. Anyway, over T2 minus T1. Now, first thing you have to calculate, S of, S of, T2, which is S of 9 seconds. And how would we do that? Plug it in 20 times 9 to the 3 has power. And how would you do that? And by the way, let's do another timeout here. Uh, should we multiply these first and then do the exponents? No. You do excuse before you do my answer, okay? So, do your exponent first, then do the multiplication. Okay, very good. Anyone hazard a guess about what 9 to the 3 has power? What does that mean? The square root of 3, <laughs> square root of, yeah, it is square root of 3. Square, square root of 9 cubed. And what's the square root of 9? 3 cubed is? Yeah. 27. All right. So this will be the 20 times 27. Okay. And what does that come out to, you said? 540. Okay. So that's equal to 540. Okay. Now guess what the good news, and by the way, that's in feet. That's what S is. Guess what the good news is here? You've already done T1. It was T2 before, but it was still 4. So that was 160. So you've already done the math here. So what does this give us? 540 feet minus 160 feet divided by what? A little louder? No, we're doing this one. Ah, nine seconds minus four seconds, okay? And this would be, what's that numerator difference? Oh, boy, get the range cranking this morning, huh? 380 feet, that's the difference there. And what's the difference below? 
I'm sorry, five seconds. Can we do that math? Let's see. Five will go into 38. Seven times with three left over. Five will go into 30. Six feet per second. Does that make sense? All right. Yeah. When you're starting from rest, you begin pretty slowly. Okay? That's when S is zero, T is zero, starting from zero. And you got up to a pretty good speed in the first four seconds. But boy, you're starting there, and you're still increasing your distance by that amount. It's a pretty good number. So yeah, you're speeding up. Now, at some point, you need to slow down. Okay? A heavy foot, you know, but you need to slow down at some point. But yeah, for the next three, uh, five seconds after that first four seconds, yeah, you're going at even a faster rate. 76 feet per second. Let it off somewhere there, but anyway. Does that kind of make sense? Let's see how they did in the book. 40 feet per second, 76 feet per second. Way to go. Guess what, team? There's a checkpoint. Like every example, have a checkpoint. So when you get a chance, home, library, wherever you can, try to do those checkpoints, then do the homeworks. Okay. Next, we'll be doing even and odd functions. I'm not going to erase that. What in the world do we mean by that? Anyone have a clue? If not, here's a definition. You have studied two different types of symmetry of a graph. Y'all remember doing that? I don't know. They may have done it in the first, what, three sections that we didn't cover. Anyway, you should have done it sometime in your not too distant past. In terminology of functions, a function is said to be even when its graph is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. What do we mean by that? If the function is doing something to the right of the y-axis, then it's an even function, it's got to be doing exactly the same thing to the left of the y-axis. That means it's symmetric about the y-axis. That makes it an even function. And its graph is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. But it's an odd function when it's really strange. No, that's not what it means. Uh, when its graph is symmetric with respect to the origin. So say that the same one up here was doing this to the right. It went here. Well, down here, it would be doing this. Exactly the opposite of that. Not the same, but the opposite. Okay? That would be an odd function. A really odd function. Probably a better example would be something that's doing this here, it would be doing that there. It's going in the opposite direction on the other side. So that's symmetric with respect to the origin. The symmetry tests yield the following test for even and odd functions. So let's say, and by the way, we are leaving something out. Anyone know what we're leaving out? The neither function. You can have functions that are not even or odd. Say a function that's doing this over here and doing this over here. Not doing the same thing and not doing the opposite thing. It's a neither. Frankly, folks, most functions are neither functions. Okay? But a lot of the functions we use will be either, either even or odd. Okay. So, um, the symmetry test yields the following test for even or odd functions. Okay, now what did I say we were doing? You check to see if it's doing what it's doing on one side of the x of the y axis with something on the other, right? So, guess what you're doing? You have a function y is equal to f of x, it's even when for every x in the domain of l, you try what's it doing in the opposite x. You take that same x, but move it there, and see what it's doing. If that's an even function, it's doing the same thing. It's going to be the same as f of x. Right? But a function of f of x, y is equal to f of x is odd when for every x in that domain of l, f of minus x is going to be the opposite. Now, what's the good news? The test is you plug in the same thing for either one. Guess what? If when you plug in this minus x instead of x, you get the same thing that you had to start with, even. 
if you get exactly the opposite thing you had to begin with, hot. What if you get not the same thing, but not the opposite? It's a neutral. Exactly. So the same test is done for all three. Plug it in, plug it in, see what you get, then determine, is it even, is it odd, or is it neither? Okay? So, let's do example eight. I really dislike this, okay? Let's start with this function. g of x is equal to x cubed minus x. There's your function. What are we wanting to test for? How do we test? What is our test? Plug in a, no, not a number, a negative x. So plug in a negative x there, and what does that give you? Negative x cubed minus a negative x. Well, what is negative x cubed? You tell me. That is, oops, let's go back to black or dark purple, okay? That would be negative x cubed. And what's negative? A uh, negative x. Positive x. All right. Question one. Is that the same as that? Is this thing the same as that thing? No. So we know it's not even. The next thing, is it exactly the opposite of that? Yes, it is. Because what we can do, if we took the opposite of this, that would make negative x cubed minus or minus v plus x. Ding, 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 ding. Yes. So this is an odd function. Make sense? All right. Let's, yeah, they did the same thing. Sorry about that. And they noted that was, then they factored out a minus sign. I was going to do that, but it, to me it was easier to multiply up there. Either way, you get exactly the opposite of what you get up there. So that is an odd function. So that is minus g of x. Yes, it passes the test for an odd function. Okay. Can I so show you how to cheat a little? Yes. Yes, you're plugging a negative x here. That's your test. Yeah. And figure out what that is. Then look at your answer and see how it compares to the Yeah. Now, you want a little cheating way? No, you don't. Okay, yeah, I do. Okay. This only, I don't want to say only, this works for polynomial functions. I can't say it will work for any other kind of functions, but it does work for polynomials. Do you know what we mean by polynomial functions? Say again? Well, it, it can have any number of terms, but... The terms are, that's the key, is what is a term? It's a variable and or a number raised only to positive integral powers. 3, 1, 0, 2, 7, 14. No negative 3s, no negative 1s, no 1 halves. It has to be positive integers only, the variable. The numbers can be anything, okay? So that's what a polynomial is. Now, if you've got a polynomial function, look at those exponents. What is that? And what kind of number is that? What? It's an odd number. What's the exponent for x? 1. That's an odd number. If all your exponents on a polynomial function are odd, you've got an odd function. Okay? We sure did here, didn't we? All right. Now, let's do the B part. Say, yeah. Okay. This function here, okay? What are you going to do first? Plug in a negative x. That's what we did here. What does that give you? Negative x squared. Put the negative inside. Plus 1. Yeah, there's no x there. What does this give you? Negative x squared. What does that give you? x squared plus 1. Guess what? That's the same as h of s. What does that tell you? Even. Very good. Let's see if our test works again.
Plug your exponent here. And what is that? Even. Do you see an exponent here? Okay. One is x to the what power? Zero power. Guess what zero is? Even. Okay, so yeah, this is an even function. All right. What they didn't do, shame on them, is uh, do a neither. But guess what? They do one in the checkpoint. Okay? Can you look at those three in the checkpoint and tell me which one of those has potential? Well, I've made it just way too easy, haven't I? Which one of those would you guess might be a neither function? A. A would be neither. And why is that? Down here, A is f of x is equal to 5 minus 3x. Okay? Uh, what's the test? F of negative x. And what does that tell you, give you? 5 minus 3 times a negative x. And what does that give you? 5 plus 3x. Okay? Is that the same as f? No. Is that exactly the opposite of f? No. This is a neither function. How could you have told that before? This is a polynomial. What's your exponent here? Zero. What's your exponent there? One. Even. Five. This is even. Okay? Absolutely right. And in fact, we even know how that looks if we were to graph it. Tell me how to graph that function. Where would I start? Okay, go up five on the y-axis. Do you all recognize that, or is that a little fuzzy? Would it help if I rewrote this as minus 3x plus 5? It's the same thing, isn't it? What does that look like now? mx plus b. mx plus b. What does b stand for? Y-intercept. That's why he went to 0, 5. So there's where you start, 0, 5 the y-intercept, and then where do you go from there? Down 3, right 1. Down 3, right 1. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Down 3, right 1. Down 3, right 1. Down 3, right 1. Or you could have gone up 3, left 1. I don't know where I left it, but anyway. Up another 3 left one, straight line, okay, is that the same thing on the right and the left, no, not an even function, is it the same thing up here as it is down here, no, it's not an odd function, that's a neither function, it neither reflects across the y-axis nor does it reflect across the other, nowhere close, it's a neither, all right, unfortunately we finished 1.5. Any questions on 1.5? Okay, let's look at the vocabulary top of uh, the on 1.5 exercise. The blank, blank, blank is used to determine whether the graph of an equation is a function of y in terms of x. You've got the graph of an equation. How can you use that graph to determine whether it's a function or not? Vertical line test, right. It has to cross only once, okay? Number two, the blank of a function, f, are the values of x for which f of x equals zero. The zeros of a function, you got it. Number three, a function, f, is blank on an interval when for any x1 and x2 in the interval, as long as x1 is less than x2, that implies that f of x1 was greater than f of x2. That function f is negative infinity. Okay, not negative infinity. It's okay. What it's saying is for any x, x1 is the length of x2, less than x2. So f of 1, x1 is greater than f of x2. What's that function doing? 
Decreasing function. It's a decreasing function. Very good. All right. Number four, a function value f of a is a relative blank of f when there exists on the interval x1 and x2 that contain a somewhere in between there such that for all the x's inside between x1 and x2 implies that f of a is greater than or equal to any of those other x's. Relative maximum, okay? Uh, and yeah, maximum is the word they were looking for. Number five, the blank, 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 blank between two points, x1 and f of x1, and x2, f of x2, is the slope of the line between those two points. Average rate of change, excellent. That middle, the third one should be shorter, okay? And that line is called the blank line, secant line. Okay, number six. A function f is blank when for every x in the domain of f, f of x is equal to, f of minus x is equal to minus f of x. That's an odd function, isn't it? Okay, good deal. Homework exercises, uh, you've done some of these before, either seven or nine, or both if you choose. This is page 56. Either 11 or 13, or both if you choose to do those. Uh, any of the odds 15 to 23, any of the odds 25 to 29, any of the odds 31 to 37, any of the odds 39 to 45, 47 to 53, 55 to 59, either 61 or 63, or both, average rate of change. And then a few application problems, any of the odds, 65 through, well, do 65, then do either 67 or 69, then do any of the odds, 71 to 75, and any of the odds, 77 to 81. Then try doing 83 and 85, pretty good problems there. And then any of the odds, 87 through 90, uh, no, 87 to 89, either 87 or 89. And this is Yolanda, the 10 o'clock scholar. Why do you come so soon? Never mind. Okay. No deal. I'm just kidding. Okay. Anyone else come in since I called roll? Okay. All right. We don't have time for much more, but let's at least introduce what we're going to do next. Okay, well, let me make sure this is the last slide. We did all that, didn't we? Um, we didn't do that, so I, we should have. Okay, now, those two functions we did, A and B, back here, here's the A part, and this is the B part. Okay, they graphed them for us. I graphed the one that was in the thing. Here is that first one, g of x equals x cubed minus x, uh, minus x. And you notice whatever it does on the right is doing exactly the opposite thing on the left. Okay? Well, in exactly the opposite direction. Therefore, this is symmetric about the origin. They also show the line through the origin, which is the basically the identity function, y is equal to x. Okay, show that through there, and you see how this looks similar on either side of that. It's not reflected across it, but it looks similar. Okay? The second of those functions, h of x equals x squared plus 1, what do we call that shape? A parabola. A parabola is always symmetric about something. We call that its line of symmetry. This just happens to be the x axis, I mean the y axis here, so that makes it in. What kind of function? Even function, which I'll same thing on the left as on the right. Okay, very good. Right. Symmetric about the y axis. Now, guess what that's saying? They're using that line to show point. So many units on that side is going to be the same as on this side. So, f of minus x equal f of x. What they're showing here is f of minus x is minus y, or f of x is y. So, that's why that line is there. Okay, with that done, now we've gone over. 
So we'll begin next time with 1.6. And frankly, folks, 1.6 is a fairly quick section. I don't know if we'll finish it in one day. We might. If we do, I'll try to have your quiz ready for you then on Thursday, okay? And if you want to start it, even if we don't finish 1.6, you can start it a day early and, and uh, take it home and have the weekend to work on. Okay? Any questions? All right. Good deal. We'll see you Thursday. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, boy, right under the wire. Okay, skin of the food. Okay? Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's just I don't have a lot of office hours, but anytime during office hours, I'll be glad to see you. Yeah. Uh, what days are better? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday? What's that? You don't. You're not here on Friday. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm on the Birmingham campus on Friday, Monday, Friday. Uh, 7:45 to 11:45. No, 7:45 to 1 on, on Birmingham campus on Fridays. Now they love calling meetings, but we had one last Friday, so hopefully we won't for a while. Okay. Uh, on this campus on Tuesday, Thursday, uh, basically 10:45 to to 12:30, about it. Okay. And Monday and Wednesday. Um, 3.15 to 5.15 maybe. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, you're right. Been recording all that, right. Okay. Good eyes there. <laughs>